Hey, come on in. Have a seat. How you doing today? Jim Holland with Texas Rangers. I've got a bunch of things to kind of explain to you. I'm guessing you probably have about 50,000 questions right now in your mind wondering what's going on. Would I be right with that? This is John Macris, and he is about to be interrogated by a Texas Ranger. The body of John's wife, Laura, had been found in the living room of her home. Um, I don't really have any questions for you, um, but I do want to explain the process and kind of explain what's going on and why you're here today. I'm sure there's some curiosity there. Um, before we begin that, in other words, before I begin a dialogue with you, I need to read you this form, and then if you agree, then I'll kind of tell you what's going on. Nothing happens in this room that, that you don't want to happen. You don't want to talk to me, you don't want to answer questions, and that's cool. All you got to do is uh, say it, and, uh, and we're done, and you know you go back. <clears throat> but I figured I would take this opportunity to at least kind of explain to you what's going on, and I figured you would probably have questions about what's going on. I'm kind of... Um, Pretty straightforward guy. I just kind of throw stuff out there, all right. So I'll just kind of wrap through it. And if I'm if I'm going, if I lose you or anything, then just stop me and ask a question. If you want clarification or anything, then all you gotta do is ask me. Okay, pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna lie to you or blow smoke or anything like that. Cool. All right. At first, the police believed that it was a robbery gone wrong. The safe in the home was empty, and there were no witnesses to the crime, so the police had very little to go on. The governor of Texas decided to put a UCIT member on the case, and he was able to find quite a bit of evidence that pointed at John. We will discuss that evidence later in this video, but first, the Texas Ranger explains to John exactly who he is. Number one, let me tell you about me. I'm uh, Jim Holland. I'm a Texas Ranger, but I'm not just a regular Texas Ranger. Do you know what, you know what Rangers do? Not really. Okay, you met a Ranger in this case already. Uh, uh, somebody talked to me. <clears throat> right, a younger guy. So um, I'm what they call a USIT ranger. So there's about 120 rangers in the state of Texas, okay? Uh, they do a bunch of different things from murders to homicide to public corruption, you name it, and they do it. All right, there's eight guys called USIT rangers. Okay, what? USIT, U C I T. Okay. Unsolved Crime Investigative Team. So of all the 120 rangers, if you get picked to be one of these eight dudes, then you must be pretty good. Uh, no one who's young ever gets picked. Uh, no one who's bad ever gets picked. Uh, only people that are exemplary in what they do and, and have a lot of success. Um, so I'm fortunate, I guess, or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, because I get a bunch more work to do that, which means I've been a ranger for a really long time. Uh, I've been doing this stuff for about 23, 24 years, and I'm pretty good at what I'm doing. I'm really good at what I'm doing, or I wouldn't be doing this. When my phone rings, it's usually the governor. And if it's not the governor, it's the director of the Texas DPS or the chief of the rangers. Uh, and they call me for special assignments. And I go all over. I go all over the world. I've been to Turkey. I've been to Greece on business, but I've been to Turkey on business. But I travel all over the U.S. and I do, um, I guess, special cases. I don't work just regular murders. I don't, I don't do anything like that. All I work is murders. But primarily what I work is uh, serial murders, interestingly uh, enough. Um, and then I work cases that uh, haven't been solved or can't be solved, and I don't even work normal ones of those, I work high profile ones. Uh, so normally I get a phone call, in this case I got a phone call from the governor. And the reason that the governor called was is because, uh, Laura's mother uh, was calling, writing emails, and other family members were calling and writing emails wanting to know, <clears throat> you know, why hasn't this murder been solved? So after X number of emails and um, phone calls and well, I'll be honest with you, news coverage because you know, obviously politicians care about the news and the governor cares about the news. I get a phone call and he says, Jim, I need you to go over to Dallas. He says, Sir, go solve this. Right oh. And uh, basically, what I do is I come up here and uh, I take over. I, uh, I take it and I look at it and I tear through it and I solve it. And uh, in my job, there's no excuses for not having results. In other words, at the end of the day, I make arrests, I solve crimes, I get convictions. If I don't do that, then I don't get to keep my job. So I'm really good at what I do. And when I get told to do it, it's usually a pretty short time frame. I don't take months or years to do things. I come up here and I work for a week, straight through, and everyone kisses my ass. They do what I want them to do or what I tell them to do because they know that I'm here to solve this and they know that I'm working for the governor. So everyone bends over backwards 
So a lot of times I look at cases and I look for <clears throat> forensic evidence. And the neat thing about me is if I find something that needs to be tested for DNA or fingerprints or whatever, basically I go back and uh, look at forensics, look at evidence, uh, and the things that would take six months or a year to review and get results on takes me an hour or two. And the forensics, whether it's cell phones or towers or the latest and greatest gizmos and gadgets in the electronic field that other people don't have at their access, I have. And I can have engineers and computer specialists and phone experts and all these different things mapping people do what I need done, usually in a matter of hours, sometimes if it's complicated a day or two. So I have everything that anyone could ever want at their disposal and I'm told to go up there and go solve the case. So in this case, that's basically what I did. Um, and I want to explain to you, if you want me to, how I got here. Sure. Um, the ranger tells John that he is no ordinary police officer. By describing who he is and detailing all the resources at his disposal, the ranger is manipulating John into believing that he has already solved the case. The truth is that the ranger has gathered evidence that led him to believe that John paid two men to kill his wife. The two men are James Valletta and Jesus Trevino. There's a couple problems. <laughs> what do you mean? Let me explain them to you. So, you know James Valletta, right? Okay. Oh, he is, yes. I did not really have an with him. Okay, and you know uh, Mr. Trevino there, right? Yes, with him I know him several years. And you know those guys have obviously been sitting in jail here for a while. Yes. Okay, so uh, I can kind of take a long time or I can just cut to the chase and just lay shit out to you. Are you a pretty straightforward dude? I mean, you don't seem like an overly talkative guy. I mean, uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's like, I don't know. Go ahead. Okay. Well, those two knuckleheads have been in jail for a long time, so let me kind of cut to the chase. So you can imagine why you're arrested, okay? One of the reasons, okay? Mm, I don't want too much. My imagination is bad. Okay, well, I, I'll get to that. Here's you, Mr. Uh, Just call the zone. All right. Jesus and James working for you, right? Pretty good dudes. You only know Jesus for, or you know uh, James for just a little bit of time, right? Correct. I know Jesus from before, and uh, Jesus brought James because we needed to help, uh, increase the, my crew. Okay. Well, let me cut to the chase a little bit. Jesus is a dumbass. All right. Sometimes he. No, he he really is a dumbass. Okay. At the end of the day, you shouldn't hire a dumbass to do a job because he's going to screw it up. All right. And if he doesn't screw it up, he's going to talk about it. And that's what happens with him. Now, at the end of the day, I think there's a, a bright light for you, and I'll kind of get there and explain that to you, okay? But this is the deal. A year ago, you know this chick? Hmm. What's your name, Lorena? Lorena Elizabeth Rodriguez. Two hundred fifteen pounds. She ain't so small. But she weighs more than you. I'm about to fifty now. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, you guys can wear the same pants. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Okay. Well, this is the deal. Her and Jesus, main squeeze, right? What does that mean? That means that they were, at a minimum, having sex. How's that? Okay. Okay. Apparently, Jesus like big girls. Simple, simple stuff. So I can. They were copulating. How's that? I don't know that either. Sex. I understand what you said there, what you said. Oh, okay, okay. So this is the deal. Jesus is sleeping with this girl, right? Mm. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I jumped ahead of myself. I hate it when I do that. The ranger begins to explain to John how all the evidence led to him. It starts with a picture of Jesus' girlfriend holding the same caliber of weapon that had taken Laura's life. So this is the deal. When this murder goes down, Laura, your wife, I'm going say, sorry. A couple months later, Janet is getting interviewed and questioned and everything like that, and she comes forward. Actually, they approach her after they find this, 
on a web page. And this is her with a gun, which is a 40 caliber Springfield XD. The bullet that killed your wife was a 40 caliber weapon. Okay? This is Jesus's apartment or where he was staying with the SpongeBob stuff. We went back and took some pictures. So she's kind of hanging out there with the stuff on the internet. So I'll, let, I'll give them their kudos when they deserve it. They go and they find her, and I have since gone back and interviewed her and spoken with her. <clears throat> and six months ago, I'm sorry, six months before your wife was murdered, she claims, all right, I'm just about, it's a claim. She comes forward and says that she was talking to Jesus. And that Jesus says that you... Uh, offered to pay him money to kill Laura. And uh, I think it was four or nine thousand, but now the number of mountains all over from nine to fifteen thousand or something. But she says this. And she says that Jesus not only told her that you hired him to kill your wife because uh, you didn't want to get married and uh, you wanted uh, custody of the children. That's what she says. Well, come on, it's, she's just some kind of gangbanger chick, right? Look at her. Do we believe this shit? Do you think she's credible? Um, oh, come on. You wouldn't listen to that, would you? So when I hear that this girl says that Jesus told her that he'd been hired by you to kill your wife um, and was going to be paid X amount of dollars, I mean, I thought that was kind of bullshit. And then they show me these pictures. I'm like, all right. So you know what? I'm going to fly to Colorado, and I'm going to go interview her myself. And I'm going to give her a polygraph. And you know what she told me? And I believe her. And she passed the polygraph. But, look at her. Would you so what? Well, right. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You said, say to me again, what did you say? You know what did she told me? I didn't understand what you just said. So, I didn't believe this. I thought, well, she's probably not credible. So I went to Colorado and I interviewed her, and I'm an expert, right? I'm supposed to be one of the best, right? 100% okay. solvency rate in every homicide that I've ever investigated. 100%. That's why I've got the job that I have, right? I understand. So I sit down and I interview her, and there's no indication of deception. She's telling the truth. There's no indication for what? No indications of deception. She is, deception, okay. She's not lying. She's telling the truth. I'm convinced of that, just in case I give her a polygraph. And she passes that. Okay. When you say she passes that, what do you mean? I'm not... I mean, she was asked those questions when she was hooked up to a machine, and she gave the same answers, and the polygraph showed that she was telling the truth. Now, I don't really give a shit what the polygraph says, other than the fact it's just something else to prove up, right? Shows that she's being credible. Maybe people think I'm an idiot, and I don't know what I'm doing. They don't really think that, but sometimes I like to imagine that. Right? Alright, so... Um, but you wouldn't think much about that, about this girl jumping out there and maybe Jesus runs his mouth or something. Well, but I'm not going to see how decent he came in. Yeah, it's not credible, right? I mean, you wouldn't buy that shit, would you? I was say, uh, I wouldn't buy it. It doesn't mean anything, right? So then, if we go back. We interview her. She steps forward and she says that a year ago, um, while she was involved with Jesus. She said that Jesus told her that you were going to pay Jesus $9,000 for killing your wife because you wanted to keep custody of the kids. I didn't have any problems with my wife. I'm just telling you what they're saying. I'm, I'm not here asking you questions. I just want to tell you what's out there. You should know what's out there, right? I mean, you want to know, don't you? I mean, like, you're under arrest. Yeah, I guess you're going to tell my lawyer, so it yeah, doesn't make any yeah. difference, right? Yeah, you can tell them too. You can leave, you can do whatever. I'm just trying to explain it to you. If you want to hear it, then I'll, I will. If you want to leave, then let me know, and we'll, we'll bring someone. So, I would want to know. If I was accused of something, want I wouldn't want to know. know. I wouldn't want to know what's out there. I'm like, I didn't tell you. So, she says that a year ago, Jesus told her that he was going to get paid $9,000 to kill your wife because you wanted to keep the children and you didn't want to get married. <laughs> or you just wanted to keep the kids. And she goes into a little bit of detail about what he was planning to do and why it was going to happen. But So you got another chick, right? She's, she's probably some gangbanger. She's dating Jesus, right? 
You think she's credible? Well, she says was doing a lot of chicks. So. Right, right. So he's just running his mouth, right? I mean, she's probably just making shit up. She's coming forward after the fact. She wants to be famous. She wants to be on entertainment tonight, right? Yes. Okay. Kind of maybe, but the problem is, <clears throat> is she says, no, I'm not making this up, and no, I believed it, and yes, it happened, and I'm so sure of this that I called up the Dallas Police Department, and I talked to a detective, and I gave him all the information. When? A year before the murder. Bullshit. No, I did. I called him. I told him every single thing. I told him <clears throat> what I knew. I gave him uh, John's name. I gave him the wife's name. I gave him all of Jesus' information, what he drives, about the gun, everything. I told him everything. I said, okay, well, let us look for that report. We don't find it. There's no report. She never called Dallas PD. But guess what? A day later, they find the report. Not only did she call them, and not only did they take a report, but the whole thing was recorded, right? And then they handed off to a Department of Public Safety, State Police, CID agent who works intelligence hits. And he starts looking at it. I don't know, his wife got sick and his mom died and kids have scarlet fever. For whatever reason, he didn't really do shit with it other than open the file, ran your name, runs your wife's name, pulls up your house on Google Maps, and uh, runs Jesus. A year before your wife dies. Now there's two people that are saying the exact same thing, and one of them is memorialized a year before. Is what? It's recorded. Okay. There's a record. There's reports. There's documents. It's not made up. It's not bullshit. How would she know it's gonna happen? <laughs> the ranger explains that not only did Jesus's girlfriend say that Jesus told her that John paid him to kill his wife but she also knew it would happen a year prior to the incident. She even filed a police report because she thought Jesus would go through with it. You know this dude? Yes. How do you know him? He, my own brought him to, to help with some work around me. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? Whatever, just helping mm -hmm. stuff in the houses. How long before your wife's murder? It's been a while. Mm -hmm. So, Brain surgeon, Mr. Trevino, reaches out to him and says, hey, this is the deal, dude. John's going to pay me $9,000 to kill his wife because he wants to keep the kids. And I need two drivers, and I want to see if you'll do it with me. The ranger is referring to a message between Jesus and James, where he tells James about the plan, and he asks if he would be the driver. The problem is... James would be brought in for questioning, and he would immediately tell the police everything. So we bring him in, he doesn't necessarily want to talk. The problem is, is he get caught up in a conspiracy to commit murder if there's any chance he has anything to do with it. So he lays out this whole story. I mean, everything. Planning what was going on, why it was bothering him, why he wasn't going to do it, all this shit. He lays everything out. So it's getting interesting. Now we got three people saying the same thing. Know him? Juan Salazar. No, I don't know that guy. Okay. Another buddy, right? Mr. Trevino's got all kinds of buddies. Guess what he does with him? He goes to him and says, hey, dude, this is the deal. My boss is paying me 15 grand to whack his wife so he can keep the kids, and I need a driver. Would you be interested in doing it? Should you not? Same thing. He comes in and gives an affidavit. A statement, he swears to it. Now we got one, two, three, four people saying the same exact shit. Boom! I mean, how are we getting all these people that are coming forward and getting information from them? I mean, they're kind of gangbanger types. It's not like they're going to just jump out there and get up. Huh? Well, yeah, but he, guess who makes it really easy? Mr. Dumbass, because guess what he does? He's got an app on his phone to record all the conversations. Yeah, no, I'm the one who told him about this app because I use this app for my clients. I bet you know how to turn it on and turn it off, don't you? What do you mean? I mean that every phone call you make, do you record it or just the ones that you want to? It's recorded in all of them and just when I finish using my conversation, I just delete it. Do mm -hmm. you think he does that or do you think he backs it up to the cloud? What would you think? You know, I think he's a dumbass. 
Wow, we you already know the answer. He backs it up to the cloud. So every phone call that he's ever made, outgoing and incoming, is backed up to the cloud. Well, because of what I do, pretty pretty good at what I do, right? Oh, yeah. Do you think Rowlett thought about that shit? Nope. But you think I did? They said, yeah, he tossed his phone the day after. We don't have shit. It's all in the cloud. Guess who has all that? All these conversations. How do I know about these people? How do I know about the guns? How do I know about all this shit? Because dumbass recorded conversations with you. Recorded. A week ago, I started working this case. Within 24 hours, it was pretty much done. Presented the facts to grand jury on Tuesday. Not for arrest, but for indictment. I'll explain that. For what? Indictment. And I'll come back to it. Okay. <clears throat> Brother? You know what he said? Dude comes up. He's getting paid $9,000 to do a hit. He needs a driver. He'll pay him four grand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that six or seven? I lose track. I don't hear your mother. Doesn't. When I say he's a dumbass, I'm dead on. Okay. But I want to keep going. I want to I prove that I actually know what I'm doing. Right? The ranger shows John the overwhelming evidence against him, and there's not much John can do but sit quietly. The ranger claims that he has recorded phone calls, witness testimony, and a picture of the murder weapon, but there is still more yet to come. Mm. Then, of course, if you're going to shoot someone, all right, and you're smart enough to get rid of the clothes and the gun, all right, you should also get rid of the backpack that the clothes and the gun are put in. Because when you shoot someone, even though you don't see it, there's something called GSR, gunshot residue, and there's blood splatter because it's high speed. When you hit something, whoosh, and even though you can't see, you watch CSI, Miami, any of those shows? Sometimes I've seen that. So when you shoot someone <clears throat> at close range, the splatter comes back at you. And if you're wearing a black hoodie when you do it, all right, you're going to have the victim's blood on you. Now, if you get rid of the black hoodie and the black pants and the black tennis shoes that you're wearing, it can be pretty good, right? Because you can just get rid of it. But the problem is, if you put all that shit along with the gun that has blood on it into this backpack, do you know what the card exchange principle is? Oh, that's fascinating. Picard is this French scientist. He's an absolute genius, right? He comes up with this theory back in 1823. Same year, mind you, that the Texas Rangers came to be. And the Lacard exchange principle is fascinating. It's that when two objects touch this table and that phone, there is an exchange. Part of that table goes onto this phone, and part of this phone goes onto that table. That makes sense, yes. Smart dude. French scientists don't screw with the French, right? They're smart. So the card exchange principle, if you take the bloody black hooded sweatshirt and the black pants that you're wearing and the gun that you shot this person with and you stick it all in that backpack, right? And then you take out that stuff and you take the gun, you put it in little pieces and you dump it in one spot and you take the clothes and you dump it, let's say, at a job site, right? In a garbage can. You're pretty smart for doing that, right? But if you put all that shit in this backpack because of the Lacard exchange principle, then there's a transfer of evidence. So where do you think this backpack was found? I don't know. I'm trying to see that. Um, it was found in James's motel room. Okay? Okay. And who do you think James said this backpack belonged to? Jesus. Yes. Right? And who do you think that all these other knuckleheads, seven, said this backpack belonged to? From where it's gone, I'm guessing Jesus. Jesus. He's the dumbass, right? And what do you think they said that Jesus always kept in that backpack? His 40 gat. 
You know what Gad is? No, sir. Gun. His pistol. Okay. How did you call it? A Gad? You never heard that? It's like gangster shit, man. Gangster. I don't know uh, any gangster stuff. <laughs> Mr. Trevino, he wants to be a gangster. His problem is he's not. He's in kind of a bind right now, and I'll explain that to you. He's got this thing. He likes to tell people that he's part of Mexican gangs that work for drug cartels, but he's really not. It's not a big deal when you do that, but when you do it and you're in jail, it's not so good. Because those people don't like people saying that they're them. And I guess. You know, they're in a, in a Mexican drug cartel gang for a reason, right? And if you're not and you're saying that shit, they take that stuff personal. Anyway, back to Mr. Trevino's backpack, which is found in James's motel room. Take that out. Raul PD does a good job and they secure that, but guess what they don't do? What would you think? That exchange of the card exchange principle, right? But the Ranger, smart son of a bitch I am. I looked at that and I said, did y'all do GSR on it? Did y'all swab it? Did you do DNA? Did you do S strand? Did you do Y strand? Did you do all the different strains that you can think of? All these high molecular $50,000 tests. Uh, what are you talking about? Right? Right? Okay. But hey, I'm, I'm a man. Governor picks up the phone for a reason. So I go down there and I see that picture. And what do you think the first thing that I do is? Tell them to do all the stuff, I guess. Tell them my ass. Takes me an hour. Takes me an hour. I drive over there by the time I'm done drinking my double latte from Starbucks. They got that shit done. They're calling me up. And guess whose DNA is in the CODIS data bank? Do you know what CODIS is? No. Combined DNA indexing system. It means if you're a shithead and you get arrested, they take your DNA. They run a swab in your mouth and it goes into this giant computer base. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's so when you get out of jail, if a shithead commits a crime and he leaves his DNA at a scene, all the police got to do is test it and they have a hit. Mm -hmm. Alright? Because he's a knucklehead and he's been to prison, we keep his DNA because we know he's going to commit more crimes. So as soon as I run this, what do you think I get? My hit, I guess. Not one. Three. I mean, if you get one or three, I mean, if it's his backpack, then isn't his His DNA would be in it, right? Yeah. What about his sweatshirt that was in there, right? He wears it, so his DNA's on it, and it's going to be inside the backpack. Do you think your wife ever walked over and bled on that? I mean, did you ever see your wife walk over to Mr. Trevino's backpack and cut her wrist and no. bleed inside no, of it? Of course not. No, she wouldn't do that. That'd be silly, wouldn't it? Of course. Well, absolutely. And that's why I've concluded that the blood that is inside here, whose DNA matched to your wife, came from the gun in the sweatshirt. The gun that he used to kill her and the sweatshirt that he was wearing when he did it. Wow. A card exchange principle. Bloody interior of backpack with GSR gunshot residue his DNA on it, seven different people saying that it's his backpack, GSR from the gun, and your wife's blood inside that backpack. What would you conclude from that? That he's guilty. Of the Hell killer. yeah, I did it. Some bitch did it. Shot your wife. Problem is, we can stop right there, right? End the show. We got him. Boom. Seven people saying that you hired him to kill your wife. If it was one, okay, two, three, seven. Can't ignore that. But there's more people involved. There's got to be more people involved. This backpack, right? The stories. Your cell phone, okay? Another piece of advice. If you're going to tell someone to go kill someone else, all right, tell them to turn off their cell phone and wrap it in aluminum foil. No shit. Right? Why? Because you have to be on your cell phone for it to be tracked. What do you mean? I mean... No, I didn't understand your, your question or your statement. If you have a cell phone, do you have to be talking on it for me, the police, big brother, to know where you are? I don't think so. Nope. So probably you can track it at any time without me being on it. Unless it's wrapped in aluminum foil. Okay. Pretty smart. That's the only thing that'll cut the signal off from the tower. But when that, you look at your phone, you see the bars, the tower bars, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like a one, two, three. We use those, tower strength, signal strength, 
with a trajectory from the tower. In other words, if you're standing right here and the tower is right here, you're an engineer, you went to two extra years in, uh, after high school, right? To be a civil engineer, mm -hmm. okay? Then you know about trajectory and angles. Yes. Based on Start that. Um, Scandals can be upon your location. Exactly. And so you know what this does? It pinpoints. Can I call him dumbass? Is that okay? Is that all right with you? Because he is. So it pinpoints dumbass's signal at James's apartment, hotel, motel, sorry, there's a difference. Picking him up and then driving. Can you show me where your house is on there? Yeah, that's it. You know why that X is there? Because it picks him up driving to your house and at really pretty much the exact time that we feel like your wife was murdered within a minute and a half to 20 minutes of her getting home because you just barely beat her there. His phone is tinging at your house. And then his phone goes all the way back towards, where's this? Oh, right here. And it stays there for just a little bit. And then it goes to, where's that Home Depot at? Right here. There. This is where he came and met me. Yep. Right after he killed your wife. So, if I know that he's at James's motel, what do you think that makes me to believe about James? That he's in a home somehow. Bingo! Now that the ranger has shown John how he knows that Jesus was the shooter and how James was the driver, he will explain how he knows John was the one who set it all up. So then he sits down and he gives a statement. And in that statement, he specifically talks about how he was part of the conversation between you and him talking about how this was going to go down. And how you three went into a room after the murder and discussed how everyone needed to shut up and keep quiet the day after the murder. But let's go forward a little bit. He also says that he was a big sissy and he wouldn't just do it. He kept dragging it out. He says that you got really, really mad about that and that you told Mr. Trevino that you need to get the, your shit together and knock it out because you haven't done anything to plan for the wedding. You haven't gotten a tuxedo and now your mom's going to be coming and he needs to get this shit done. Then he says, one-on-one, <clears throat> -on -one, right, that while you guys were out at a dump, that you have a conversation with him and you're talking about the murder and is he really going to do it? And he says, no, I think he's a big sissy. And then you turn around and say, well, he was supposed to do another job for me, my ex-wife down in Georgia. Would you do a hit for $15,000? And he says, well, that's not really my deal. I don't really do that. <clears throat> because he's not really a hitter. So... Someone who's going to do a murder shouldn't hire someone who is afraid of the sight of blood, right, to do it. And they shouldn't hire someone who's not really a shithead. He's not really a shithead. He's a pretty legitimate dude. He just has some issues, and he did something really, really stupid. You shouldn't bring him along for the ride, and then you shouldn't have a conversation with him about it. Now, you can blow off everything that he said, and you can blow off everything that he said, but the deal is these two have been separated, and they were both interviewed, and they both said exactly the same thing. All right? You paid him to have your wife killed. Now, these two, who's admitting to doing the murder, the gun, the clothes, phone conversations, everything, all right? I did it. He go be there. That'd be one thing, but they have no reason to do that murder unless they're getting paid. And I got seven other people saying that they paid them, and these two are completely separate, and they're telling me the exact same freaking story. And they haven't had an opportunity to get their story together. And they both tell me what was said in that bedroom the day after your wife was murdered. The final piece of evidence is that all three men were in the same room, discussing what they should do with the body. The ranger took Jesus and James and interviewed them separately, and they were both able to recall the same conversation. They both told the ranger what John had said, and both of their testimonies matched. With this final nail in the coffin, the ranger will tell John what his options are. Okay, now, you have choices, my friend, okay? Because this looks really, really bad for you, all right? And that's why on Tuesday, this was presented to a grand jury. Do you know 
about the American legal system and the grand jury? I have no idea. Anyone can be arrested. Man, I could write out a probable cause affidavit that you committed murder, okay? And I could arrest you for it. Just like that. I just boom, and the judge signs it, okay? But I'm guessing by now you know that I'm just not this ordinary cop, right? Mm -hmm. I'm different. I'm anal retentive. I'm ADD. I can't help it. All right? I go overboard on everything. So I grab all this shit, all my forensics, all my phone stuff, all my statements, all my you name it. I grab everything and I present it to a grand jury. When a grand jury does an indictment, all right, that means that one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to go to trial or you're going to plead guilty. Okay? On Tuesday, this was presented to a grand jury, and on Tuesday I found out that the grand jury indicted you and him for capital murder. This is coming today. Okay? That means that there's no probable cause statement. That means that the grand jury issues the warrant, which means there's evidence to move forward. And at this point, you're looking at a long time in prison or the death penalty. Okay? Now... Why am I telling you all this? Because I think it's right that you know everything, okay? I think that's important. But you have a choice to make. And I'm going to tell you what the positive is. What the what? Positive. The good. Okay. Okay. I don't like him. All right? And he's killed other people. I wouldn't like him either. I just want to. <laughs> all right. Well, he's killed other people. Okay. So in the United States, when you kill three or more people, do you know what you're called? A serial murderer. This wannabe has actually killed two other people. That means that he's killed three people total, all right? Which makes him a serial murderer, and a serial murderer needs to go to death row and die. He just never, ever needs to get out. Now, John, I know that you're kind of foreign to this country, and I know that I'm throwing a lot at you, but I'm going to give you an opportunity today. And it's really important that you understand this because I don't want to lie to you, and I don't want you to misunderstand anything that I'm saying, okay? I'm not the decision maker. I'm not the district attorney. I'm not the district judge. I'm not a grand jury. I'm none of those people, okay? I'm, I'm a Texas ranger. Now, granted, I'm one who answers phone calls from the governor, right? Mm -hmm. I don't carry his bags, just answer the phone, do what he asks me to do. But I'm a Texas Ranger, I'm not a decision maker, okay? After we meet today, I'm going to go upstairs, because we're also in the Criminal Justice Center here. And I'm going to go over, I'm going to meet with the district attorney, and I'm going to tell her exactly how this interview went, and she's going to ask me a bunch of questions about it, okay? And you've got to make a decision as to what you want to do or how you want to proceed with things, okay? This country is very interesting and in that if people show remorse and if they're sorry and they beg for forgiveness, all right, and they tell the truth, things tend to go better for them. If they tend not to do that, all right, then this is a death penalty case and that's what you're looking at. And if you're not afraid to die, I understand. Really, I'm not either. But the problem is, is you have to sit on death row for like 12 to 15 years and it's a really, really horrible existence, okay? And I don't think that you... I don't know who you are. I'm not really kind of trying to figure you out. I'm honest. I'll be brutally honest. I don't know if you're a sociopath, if you're a psychopath. And I kind of looked into it some more, and I don't think you're any of those things. I think that you felt like your wife was cheating on you, and I think that you thought your wife was not a good uh, mother, and I think that you were probably right, and I think you felt like she was going to leave you and she was going to take the kids, and I think that you were right because I think that she was going to. I think she was going to marry you so she gave you half the business and she was gone. And you know that. And I know that. No, I don't. That's what I believe. No, I don't. I don't believe that for sure at all. I mean, no, I don't believe that. I do not think that Laura will. I mean, the business was hers anyway, so it doesn't matter me married, get married with her or not. So that's. I mean, I have no. Then why, John? Why? Because you still want to get married? Because you want to No, I didn't things? have a problem to get married. I mean, I tried to get married with her for at least three years. Mm -hmm. I love her. I still love her. I mean, it's, you know, I love my kids when they took my kids away. It's like killing me. It's... Well, right now, you have an opportunity. Because, number one, you have an opportunity to ease the pain from them. Okay? 
And there's something called consideration, all right? And I'm not, again, the deal maker, but I can tell you, you move forward with this stuff and these people testifying against you and everything else and you get the death penalty, okay? This thing about consideration, okay? The best thing going here, and normally you know how this works, it's the person who hires that they're really after, all right? But you don't have a criminal history. You've never been in trouble before. Oh, I mean, I... Oh. It's a pain in the ass, right? So, mm, they're not really... You're you. You're like there. Yeah, you need to be punished, but this guy, he's bad. He really needs to go to death row, okay? So, at the end of the day, I think that you have an opportunity, and your opportunity is to be honest, to ask for forgiveness, all right? and to cooperate with all this and move forward and hope for consideration. And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I'll tell you what's going to happen with this stuff. If you end up going to a trial, you're going to get convicted and you're going to get the death penalty. Okay? Period. I don't think you want that. I don't think your children want that. I know that, that they wouldn't want to have to deal with that. But if you are sorry, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if you're sorry, for what happened and the way things happened, all right? And if you want to tell that story, then I will go to the district attorney and I will tell her that you cooperated with this investigation and that you made a really, really bad mistake and that you're sorry, but that you gave up the information about these two and specifically him, which is what she wants. And I think that gives you an opportunity moving forward. I can't promise you that. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you. But I think that it gives you a really, really, really good opportunity moving forward. Okay? And it's your choice. It's what you want to do, but it's not going to be presented to you again. And I know that's a lot to be thrown at you. But I think you knew this. You're not surprised with this. You knew this day was coming. I mean, you're not freaked out. You're not nervous. You're not the new. I am nervous. I mean, it just. You know it's coming, John. You know what's coming. Now you got to make a decision. You know what mitigation of damages is? No. It's when you screw up and try to make the best of it. Okay? You screwed up, all right? And now you got to try to make the best of it. And let me tell you something else. Greek Orthodox? Mm-hmm. How do that? Christianity, all right? Americans. The district judge, the jury, the grand jury, and the district attorney are all good Christian people. Because in America, you really don't get elected unless you're a good Christian person, right? And what's a value that all Christians share? What's the number one rule of Christianity? Spread the word of God. Number two, you got to forgive. If you're a good Christian, you have to forgive, and it doesn't matter. I sat down one time, Catholic, right? I've been, I've got uh, some Roman, uh, I'm sorry, Roman Catholic, some uh, Greek Orthodox. I got a uh, cousin who married from Chicago, a guy who's Greek Orthodox. Same thing, I just kind of love the boat, right? Yeah. Same thing. So, what's the difference between a good person and a bad person? Does, does, does Mother Teresa make mistakes? Everybody makes mistakes, I don't care who it is. <laughs> Pope makes mistakes, right? Hmm? Pope makes mistakes. Oh, no, I'm sure he does. What's the difference between a good person and a bad person? A good person makes a mistake, and they say that they're sorry, and they ask for forgiveness and redemption, and they move on down the road. A bad person who makes a mistake, he just keeps moving down the road. He never says he's sorry. He never asks for forgiveness. He never asks for redemption. Do you want to know who gets the death penalty? Those people. I put a lot of people on death row, and there's a bunch of people sitting there right now because of me. And people ask me, how do you do that? How do you sleep at night? Let me tell you how I sleep at night. Just do my job. Okay. Number one, I didn't kill anyone. Okay? All right? <laughs> Number two, I give everyone choices, and I'm legitimate with everyone. Good Catholic boy. All right? I can't lie to you. You know, I turn blue or something. You know, I have to go 50 uh, Hail Marys and a couple of our fathers. It's, it's against my uh, my beliefs. I'm honest, and I give you options, and I let you make choices. And at the end of the day, it's all about choices, John. All right. 
And you have a choice today, and you make a decision. And when I go to bed, and I tell my son this, when you go to bed at night and you lay your head down, you should be able to sleep with a clear conscience. If you did something wrong, you pray to God, you ask for forgiveness, and try to do the right thing the next day. You make amends for your mistakes, all right? I sleep at night because I give people the opportunities. Because the people that end up on death row end up on death row because I made that choice. Not because they killed someone, not because they had someone kill someone, but because I made the choice not to cooperate and not to ask for forgiveness and not to say that they're sorry. Because when you go in front of that jury and you go in front of that district judge and you go in front of that district attorney and you step up there and you don't tell them that you're sorry for what you did, they're going to think you're some bitch and they're going to want you to die. So can I talk to, to my attorney before? You can do anything you want. If you want your attorney right now, you can tell me, I want my attorney right now and I don't want to talk to you. But that's up to you. You control these things, okay? But I'm not going to come back and... and no, I don't, I don't know how this thing works. I don't know how the legislation works. I don't know anything about the legal system mm -hmm. in the United States works. And this is where I would like to, to talk to somebody uh, okay, and, and let me explain something real quick, all right? About this, because I really don't... Okay, let me explain something real quick. Um, there's a couple different things you can do right now, okay? You can completely turn me off forever. In other words, I'm never going to come back and talk to you again by telling me, Ranger, I would like to talk to my attorney, and I don't want to talk to you anymore, and then I'm never, ever going to come back and talk to you again. I'm done, okay? And that's your right, and you can do that right now if you choose to. You can say, I would like to take a break. Maybe we could talk later. Um, I would like to go back to my cell or be booked in, and maybe we can talk later. You can say, I never, ever want to see you again. That's your choice. But once you've shut that door, that door is shut forever. And I want you to make sure that you're aware of that, okay? Because the opportunity that's right here, and it's your choice. If you want your attorney, if you want to end it, then I walk out this door right now, and that's all you have to say, and it's done. I mean, I think that... Again, I think that I need to talk to the attorney and because I'm like, okay, and then, you know, tell him all the stuff that he told me and, you know, it's like, I'm not saying that, I'm not, I don't know what. I don't know how to. Okay. If, if you want an attorney, then you just tell me that and we're done. And I'm going to go talk to him again next, right now. But that's your choice. If you want an attorney, then you need to tell me that, though. You need to say, I want my attorney. I don't want to talk to you right now. If you want to just end the interview, you can say, I want to end the interview. That's your choice, okay? That's your legal right. You're, even though you're not an American citizen, are you? I don't know. I'm a resident. I was okay, you're applying for a citizen. Okay. But. Because you're in America, it doesn't matter if you're from Mars, you have the rights that the Constitution afforded to every American. Even though you're not an American, you still get those rights. And that's your choice. You, mm -hmm. But you decide that. If you don't want to talk to me, if you want an attorney, then you tell me that, okay? If you want to just end it and stop it, then that's fine. I'm just telling you where I'm going next. As much as John wants to talk to his lawyer, he knows that by invoking his rights, the ranger will go speak with his co-defendant, Jesus, and see what he has to say. John believes that the ranger wants Jesus more because he is a three-time offender. He also believes that if the ranger walks out the door, he will most likely get the death penalty. Unfortunately for John, he can't have his cake and eat it too. In other words, I'm not coming back. I'm going to go talk to him and I'm going to take his statement and then we'll just keep charging down the road. But that's your choice. So I cannot have a choice of speaking with the attorney and... You can have an attorney right now. Do you want an attorney? I mean, I want to talk to the, to the attorney and, and then get back to you to... End okay, it. you want to end this interview right now? That's your choice. You just tell me that. I mean, you're kind of saying it like it's a big question or you're throwing a bunch of things out there. So I'm not sure how to take it. I know it's a big deal, but I want to make well, sure that we're it, on the same page. It, 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 of course, it is a big deal. I mean, you're telling me that, you know, you're telling me that uh, basically admitting that I hired him 
to do the murder. That's what you're telling me. Am I telling you to admit that? No, I already know that you did that. I'm giving you an opportunity okay. to tell the truth and come forward and to ask for some type of consideration for doing the right thing and for helping me to put sure and make sure that this guy goes to death row. That's what I'm talking about. There's not a question of if you did this or you didn't do that. I already know the answer to it. I already know that you hired him. I know that he drove. I know that he's an idiot. I know that he pulled the trigger. Okay? I already know those things. It's not a question. All right? I'm not asking you questions. Did you do that? I already know the answer to that. The question is, what do you want to do? If you want your attorney, then uh, we'll end it right now. That's your choice. If you want to uh, provide information and try to help yourself out, then we can do that too. It's up to you. I don't need you to do that. Okay? This case is done. When I say I know what happened, I know what happened. That's your buddy's indictment for capital murder. That one's yours. It says your name on it. Okay? My case is done. I don't need anything from you. You don't want to give me anything. If you don't want to talk about it, then that's fine. That's up to you. I don't care. But I'm going to go have a little bit to eat because I'm kind of hungry and get a cup of coffee. Right. Well, I mean, but then, then I'm fine with that. All I'm doing is giving you an opportunity. I told you to me it comes down to laying my head on a pillow at night and going to sleep with a clear conscience. I'm giving you a choice, man. That's all I want to do. Good Catholic boy, I want to get on with my life. I want to have a clear conscience, all right? You make your own decision, you just let me know what you want to do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, it's your choice, okay? I'll be honest with you, I sat down, I had the same conversation with James. I said, James, it's your choice. I said, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna tell you exactly what there's out here. Boom, I laid all this stuff out to him, I told him what Trevino said, I told him why Trevino said it, I told him I didn't believe some of it, and then we proved all it up, it was corroborated, I've got the forensics, I've got the, uh, the blood, I've got everything. I don't need anything from you, James. However, James, you have an opportunity to help yourself out. I'm not making promises, just like I'm not making promises to you because I'm not that deal maker, I'm not the decision maker. I'm just a little wheel in the cog, but I relay messages, all right? James made a decision that he wanted to help himself out because he knew that he made a mistake. James laid out everything that happened and then James ended the conversation with, I'm sorry, would you please express uh, my remorse to the district attorney's office? I know that I made a mistake. James has got a pretty good uh, outlook ahead of him. On what? Outlook. Things are looking good for James. We're a forgiving society. We are, all right? You kill your wife, but you know what? Or you hire someone to kill your wife, but people can still forgive you for it because that's who we are. A Jejeo Christian society. We have to do that. We have to forgive no matter what you do, no matter how bad it is. We have to forgive. And I know that sounds corny and hokey, but it's the God's honest truth. Because we're Christians. You're a Christian. Right? I am. Yeah. Well, you made a mistake. You did. I mean, now it's damage control time, man. It's mitigation. If you don't give a shit and you want to go to death row, then go. Knock yourself out. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. It's a bad deal. You know? I'm not going to feel sorry for you if they do that to you. But I mean, I'm not going to feel sorry for me. Well, right? I'm not. It's not going to happen. But I'm going to give you an opportunity just like I give everyone because morally I feel like I have a compass that, that forces me to do that. But that's up to you. You know, you did something really bad and now you have an opportunity to try to make things better and to say that you're sorry. The ranger continues trying to convince John that confessing will benefit him in the end. John sits quietly unsure of what to do. The evidence is overwhelming against him and he knows he must make a choice. Either show remorse and live out the rest of your life, or get a one-way ticket to death row. You know, if you feel bad in any way, shape, or form for what happened, and do you, I don't know. You probably don't. And maybe it's not so important to you that you do, but I'm going to tell you something. You damn well better convince that jury, that district attorney, and that district judge that you feel some remorse and that you're sorry about this because if you don't, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you. They're going to kill your ass. You're going to sit on death row for 12 years in a little 8 by 10 cell. And you're going to be absolutely miserable. And then they're going to kill your ass. <clears throat> and no one's going to think twice about it. What's the best case scenario in this? Say you're sorry. You're convincing, beg for forgiveness, provide information against Knucklehead who shot your wife, 
girlfriend, fiance, at point blank range, the mother of your daughter. Maybe you get a halfway lenient sentence. Maybe you get to go to a work farm because you haven't done anything before what? this. A work farm. Maybe you get to go somewhere. You get to be outside. You get to run cattle and do carpentry and work and everything like that. It's a life. It's a lot better than being stuck behind bars. Maybe you get to go do that. And maybe they give you a halfway decent sentence. And in the state of Texas, you only have to serve about 50-60% of that sentence. So maybe you have an opportunity to actually see your daughter get married. You're not going to see her graduate kindergarten. You're not going to see her graduate eighth grade, but maybe you can see her graduate high school. Or maybe you can see her get married. Maybe you can hold her baby. Those are the things that you have to look forward to. But you know what? It's a hell of a lot better than nothing. And it's 12 years of misery. And then you're going to put them through that. And if you ever had an opportunity in your entire life to think about one thing other than yourself, this is a time. Because let me tell you something. The path to true redemption and righteousness is the recognition that it's about others. It's not about you, John. It's about others. And until you put other people in front of you in your life, Never going to recognize it. And right now, you know what? I know you're laughing. You think this is bullshit because you don't have remorse. No, I'm not. But if you don't put your kids in front of you right now and recognize that, you're going to put them through that misery of 12 to 14 years of you sitting on death row, them knowing the day that you're going to die? Either way, I'm screwed. I'm not going to do anything with my kids. I mean, uh, (laughs) hey, you have an opportunity to see your daughter get married. You might have an opportunity to see her graduate high school. Have an opportunity to, to hold your grandchild. Those are things that you have an opportunity to do. I'm not going to say it's going to happen, but there's definitely an opportunity for it out there. But what happens is determined right now by what you do in this room. And you walk out of this room, and you can do it anytime you want. Yeah, I've told you 20 different times I've admonished you. You can ask for an attorney. You can end this. You can do whatever you want. That's your decision, and I'm going to honor that. Okay? But if you want it, any opportunity in your life, to see your children again, and to live in a free world again. And it's laying in front of you, waiting for you to grab it. And if you don't, then don't waste my time. You need to convince those people that you feel some remorse, John. I don't get into the emotions of it because I'm a black and white guy. You're an engineer, kind of black and white, right? And I'm the same way. I don't. I go into a murder scene and I can see ten bodies. It wouldn't phase me for a second because I block it out. I don't let emotion cloud what I'm doing because it throws my work off and I want to do my work because I'm anal retentive and I boom, 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 boom. Okay? That's who I am. And I can block out the emotion of killing uh, this lady. Laura with children and I look at it from a black and white standpoint and to me it's very black and white you can tell us you're sorry and provide information and hope for the best or you can tell me to go pound sand and you can go off to Huntsville and they're going to stick a needle in your arm in 12 to 14 years and you're going to die you have an opportunity damage mitigation you know what it is damage control yeah, but how do I do damage control? I'm I'm trying to. You see what I said because English is not my first language. Okay, things that they come out of my mouth, they come out. Sometimes the wrong way and getting incriminating against me or being very easy to be twisted. There's not a whole lot of twisted here, John. No, 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 I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about what you saw me. All right. Okay. I'm pretty sure you did before. If you bring it to show me all stuff, you've done your due diligence. I have. Thank you. Okay. So I'm, uh, that's not what I'm, I'm guessing or I'm saying or 
uh, I don't know, how, however you want to call it, you know, you know what I mean? And that's not what I'm saying. I'm just... It just... I'm trying to think if I say something to come out the way that I, I actually mean it, then... Then... Say this. I'm sorry. Oh, I am sorry that my wife was killed. I cry so many times. I'm sorry that my kids are not are not with me. I'm sorry that my kids, they have to be gone to their biological dad, dad that they did not know them, they did not have any relationship with them. One of them was abusive uh, towards Laura and stuff, the other one was a drug addict and alcoholic. I am sorry that my kids have to be there. I'm sorry that Maria does not have your mom. I mean, my biological. You know what it sounds like, you know? John? It sounds like an argument that you discuss, all right, when they're offering you your your deal or when you're going up for sentencing, and it sounds like a mitigation of damages to me. In other words, it sounds like it's probably better to have you outside on the free world taking care of your children sooner than later, okay? Yeah, but how do I know that I'm going to be out there on the free world and... I, I'm not the guy to guarantee it, okay? I can only tell you what it begins with. I'm going to tell you that there's zero opportunity if I walk out of this room, all right? There's zero opportunity. You're going to go down to Huntsville. They're going to kill your ass, okay? I can guarantee you that. What is that? What do you mean? The death penalty. You're going to go to, to the death row down in Huntsville, all right? You see it. Come on. You're not arguing with it. You're not even denying it, John. You're sitting there kind of nodding your head. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a done deal. We're past it. We're past it. It's done. It's about the decision that you want to make, John. There's no arguing this. I don't want to argue with it. I don't really want to discuss it with you. I just told you what I have because I think it's fair that you should know everything that's stacked up against you. And I think more than anything, what I wanted to tell you is I wanted you to know how much of a dumbass Trevino was because if anything, it should motivate you to help make sure that he gets the death penalty. Right? He screwed you over. You go to hire this dumbass, and he tells seven different people that you want him to kill your wife because you want custody of the children. He tells seven different people that how much money you're offering. But I didn't hire the dumbass. That's my problem. Do what? I did not hire the Come dumbass. On. I did not pay him any money. That's, that's my problem. I had his cars buy back on the past that, you know, that I had problems with Laura, but then afterwards, especially once she said yes to the wedding and yes to all the stuff. So you're saying that you told him in the past to kill her and then you changed your mind and no, still I did it? Because if you did, hey, that's mitigation of, the, of, uh, of circumstances there. If you, if you arranged for him to kill her and then you changed your mind and said don't do it, but he still wanted the money, so he did it, then that's something that needs to come out, John, because that's not what they're giving me. I didn't... If you tried to stop it, and you couldn't, if you changed your mind at the end and tried to stop it, then that's a mitigation, John. But you have to say that. I can't say that. If you had a bad day and were running your mouth about, man, I want you to kill my wife for, for 15 grand, and you kind of played with it back and forth, but you weren't real serious, and you had another bad day, and you brought it up again, and he went and did it, right? But you changed your mind and you didn't really want it to happen, then that's a mitigation. But John, at some point, you offered him money to go kill your wife and he told him the reason why because he told all these people and it's going back a year and he didn't make this shit up, all right? If you change your mind at the end, then you need to say that. Did you change your mind at the end, John? I didn't know when Laura killed. So you changed your mind. When did you change your mind? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a mitigation, John. It's been a while. No, I didn't. I didn't really want. I mean, sometimes I was getting angry or mad with her and stuff like that. But no, I mean, I did not want you killed. So you changed your mind. 
I do not want this on the kids. You change your mind at the end and it was too late? He's all coked up. He wants the money, so he's going to do it anyway? Well, I didn't have any money to give him. I mean, there was some money on the safe, so if the, you guys didn't, didn't find it, then I don't know. Did you change your mind, John? I do not want Lord killed. So you changed your mind? Because I know you ordered him, or you asked him to do it and said you were going to pay for it, because there's a year of this shit going back that shows that you did. If you change your mind at the end, that's, then rack through it and tell me how you changed your mind. No, that's not what him I have said to them. I mean, I don't... Uh... Good conversations in front of James. Uh, Knucklehead was recording a lot of the conversations. You're pretty careful about what you said on the phone, but you still said enough to... You know what his game plan was? He's even going to blackmail you afterwards to keep getting money from you. He says there's a tape. What do you mean? He says that he did a tape of one of the conversations so he could blackmail you later. Hadn't given it to us yet. I'm guessing he will. I don't want it. It's going to be pretty screwed up. He's going to step in here, give the rest of the information, provide this tape, and he's not going to get the death penalty. Probably get a decent deal. You're going to run down to Huntsville and you didn't even pull the trigger. Sounds like you've changed your mind at the end of the day. If you change your mind, you just need to say it. He wants a deal for the tape. So what? He wants a guarantee. He wants a deal for the tape. I don't ever have to get that tape. I'd be a lot happier to send his ass down to Huntsville. Say that again? I would be much happier just to send him down to death row. And you know whatever he wants, that's... Well, it's not where he wants. Oh. That's what I prefer for him. You made a mistake, John. You fucked up. You did. Now you just need to make the best of it. And I know that sounds stupid, but I'll tell you what. How old are you now? What, 38, 40, something like that? Thank you. 38 years old, John. How long do you think you're going to live? I have no idea. Average human being right now. Is the 82 years old for a male Mediterranean diet? Hell, you might live to be 102 as a boy eating all that uh, seafood and olive oil. Yeah. So the question is from 38 to let's say 88, right? How do you live the next 40 years of your life? You know what? 10, 15, 20 of them may really suck. But you haven't been arrested for anything before. You didn't even pull the trigger. You don't have a violent history. And you know what? You have a skill set that the state of Texas would love to use. Go to a prison farm, man. Go build shit. Build bridges. Fix tractors. Run cattle. Ride horses outside. You like to ride horses? Yeah. Like being a farm boy in grief. Except you're riding horses instead of donkeys. I need to, to speak with a third person and turn or something to, to advise me because, I mean, basically right now you're telling me incriminate yourself and say that, oh, yes, you did this where I didn't give him any money. That's... That's, that's what it is. You, you know what I mean? Well, if you want to talk to an attorney, okay, and I'm still, you're kind of saying different things, but if that's what you want, then, then I'm going to end this right now, okay?
Okay, I'll take you back in the um, holding cell, and then uh, probably in just a couple minutes, they're going to take you over to what's called the North Tower, and then they're going to book you in and process you there, and then they'll put you in a cell. Okay? The Ranger never got the confession he desperately wanted. However, John would be convicted of capital murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jesus was also convicted of the same charge, and he too received life in prison. James made a deal with the prosecution. In exchange for a 25-year sentence, he testified against John and Jesus. Check the pinned comment for a link to the interrogation of Jesus Trevino, which has been posted on our second channel. Thank you for watching, and please share your thoughts in the comments below. I will see you next time, here on the Red Tree Crime YouTube channel.